It's good to see you guys. We're gonna yeah, have a you. we're gonna enjoy this little painting. I, I think it's uh it's a sweet one. You're gonna like it. going to go through our supplies. I'm actually not going to teach where you see me now. Um, I'll be teaching at the easel, but I'll just take this opportunity to make sure you guys have your supplies. Um, you should have a, a glass of water or a little container of water. Yep. Awesome. One for each painter would be good. Um, and uh, if you, hopefully you have an apron um, or something to use as an apron. There should have been an apron in your kit. Was there an apron in your kit? Yeah, good, okay. And then um, uh, paintbrushes and then all of the primary paints. So red, yellow, blue, and then black and white. And some napkins. And I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna turn off where I am now and I'm gonna go over to the easel and we'll get started, okay? I put water on the canvas and the reason I did is uh, just because it's dry here in Denver and we need to put water on the canvas just to keep it nice and moist and humid. And that way the acrylic paints will blend nicely like this painting. Uh, and uh, we, we're gonna be using three brushes tonight, a large, a medium and a small. If you have more than that, you're way ahead of the game. I'm using, yellow, red, and blue paints, also black. And uh, the reason I put yellow on my palette is just to remind you to paint whatever you want. If you don't wanna paint this exact painting and you wanna stick a Loch Ness Monster in it, you go right ahead. It's important uh, that you like your painting and that you're um, having a good time and doing your own thing. So I just put the yellow on there just as a reminder to tell you that, but we're actually not using yellow in the painting. So <clears throat> the colors that we're using are basic primary colors, red, blue, uh, uh, are two primary colors tonight. And we have about 500 different paintings in the studio and uh, each one uses a different array of colors. We have probably 50 different colors of pre-mixed paint in the back. So pre-mixed purple and orange, but in our kit, we didn't wanna have to make 500 different kinds of kits. So we just give you the primaries and we'll teach you how to mix it. The reason I'm telling you that is that when you mix your own paints, you're not gonna get exactly this purple. You're not gonna get exactly this blue, but it will still be pretty. Um, each one of us will have a shade that's unique to us. Okay, so we put our water on the canvas. If you haven't done that, go ahead and and do that. Just a, a quick, quick rinse of water all over. Oh, and I, I don't think I mentioned, this is a 16 by 20 canvas, but yours is smaller. If you're using one of our kits, yours is smaller. I need the big canvas because uh, I need to be able to show you the steps and you can see it better. And then my brushes are bigger as a result of that as well. So I might not have, I won't have exactly the same brushes you have, uh, but um, you know, I'll be using small, medium, and large, and you can find which ones in your uh, collection correspond to those. All right, so I've got water all over my canvas. And the first thing I, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in this middle area of blue. And so I'm going to pick up blue on both sides of my brush. And I'm just gonna come in and put on this really pretty ultramarine blue. And I'm doing it in little crisscross strokes. It doesn't have to be in any particular stroke. I'm not, I'm deliberately not making horizontal or vertical lines because I want it to be wispy. And actually I'm gonna take that all the way up to the top. So we're just gonna cover this background with lots of blue and I'm keeping it wispy by doing these cross X strokes. You could do circles, you could do scribbles, whatever it takes, this works for me. We have about 10 different shades of blue at our studio. We have 
phthalo blue and ultramarine blue and primary blue and cobalt blue. Uh, I think there's also a cerulean blue. Ultramarine is one of my favorites. And it's great in this painting. I'm drinking water tonight. Maybe about halfway through the class, I'm gonna switch over to a glass of red wine. You don't have to go all the way down with your paint because there's snow down there. And if you can see your brush strokes in your painting, that's absolutely fine. That'll just kind of help us make it more uh, ethereal looking. I think that's the right word. So no worries. I'm also gonna paint the sides and the top of my painting. And I'll paint the bottom with white when I get down to the snow. And I'm doing that because that's called a gallery wrap. And if I paint all around the sides and the top, then I won't have to buy a frame. And then I'll save some money and it will look modern. I'm gonna go ahead and give you time to put your paint on. And notice how blotchy mine is. Don't worry, you don't have to have it perfect, okay? Mine's not perfect either. Okay, normally I would let this dry 100% before I would attempt to paint anything over it but I want you to see that it's still shiny. Can you see that? And when it's shiny, it means it's still wet. That's a good thing. Another way to tell if something's still wet is if you touch the back of it and it's cooler than you know something that's room temperature, then that's another good way to know it's still wet. Uh, another way is to rub it on the person next to you and if they scream, then it was wet. Uh, but I don't recommend it if you're in a hotel or you're with the person you have to spend the rest of the pandemic with because they won't like it. All right, but um, so normally we would not go ahead and paint anything over this when it's wet, but because this painting has a lot of blending, we actually can do that. So unless I hear someone say that they, they need more time, and please unmute and let me know if you do, I'm gonna go ahead and show you the next step. And even if you're not there yet, that's okay. You can just watch and then catch up. But I wanna take advantage of the fact that this is still a little bit wet. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little bit of my white and a little bit of my blue. I'm not mixing all of my white and all of my blue together. I'm not. I'm just taking a little of each to make a light blue. I wanna keep, you know, keep the white and the blue separate so that I can use them for other things. But I'm just taking a little bit, just a little, and making, making a light blue. It doesn't really matter which brush you use. You can use a medium or a large. I wouldn't use the small detail brush though. I'm just mixing a little light blue paint. 
And what I'm going to do with that light blue paint is, um, so it's just a, it's blue with a little bit of white mixed in. I'm going to sketch on some lighter areas, some lighter values. And I'm just going to do it with more crisscross strokes, but I'm going to do it a little bit more randomly. Do you see these areas here? I'm just going to put on some little, a little, some lighter values. And we're going to have to be going back and forth a lot doing this kind of thing. And notice how I'm doing X's or circles. I don't want straight lines. I want it to look smoky. And circles are working pretty nice, actually. I'm barely touching the canvas though, because I want to keep it light. I want to keep this light and wispy. Barely touching the canvas. What I'm going for is kind of like the smoky, foggy effect. Very little paint, very little paint. It's almost a dry brush. I just picked up paint once and I haven't since I started. And it's in these, this center area more. More than on the sides. And kind of random. It's like somebody just drove by on a motorcycle and all the smoke puffed up. Or if you're behind a, a diesel car, something that, that had the smoke just puff up for a moment. And I'm going to keep doing that with my brush, even when it's dry. When my brush is dry, I'm going to keep doing that. And that's what gives us, makes it softer. So my brush right now has no paint on it. And I'm just messing up what I did. So it's soft. So I'm getting rid of those hard edges. Just trying to make that smoky area even more smoky by just messing it up with a dry brush. Now your background's not gonna look just like mine. Mine's not gonna look just like the original. That's okay. It's all good. No one can do you like you, right? It's not stark white, it's just, just a little, little smoky color in there. And any place where you see hard lines, just try to use your dry brush and just try to blend them out a bit. Just in this general area in the center. And notice how I didn't want a perfect rectangle or circle. This shape is kind of amoeba looking. Uh, we want to keep it irregular and imperfect. The plan is we're going to put these colors in the background. And then we'll come in and put some black at the top at, after. So in case you're wondering why we didn't paint on a black canvas, when I look at this painting up close, it's really obvious to me that they started with a blue background and then put the black on after the blue and the colors. So in case you're wondering where we're headed.
All right, when you're ready, and I don't want to rush anyone. So if you're not ready, just, just speak up and say, hey, give me more time. I'm going to drop my another brush. I'm going to try a medium brush. If I don't like it, I can, I'll switch back to my large one. Um, but I, I dipped it in water first. And then I knocked the drops off the water, but I didn't dry the brush. I wanted a little wet. And then I put a little bit of white paint on the tip of my medium brush. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to do the same thing that we just did in some random areas around the painting. And I'm looking at these areas here and this here as my inspiration. So I'm going to start by putting the paint on there and then I'm going to scribble it in really good so it kind of blends into that fog. And, and scribbles, oh, scribbles are nice. Look at that. That's what we should be doing. Look at that. Nice. Scribbles are good. Just flattening my brush and scribbling. That works the best. She's muted. In the chat box. It's not exactly in the same spots as where that light blue was. It's even more in the center, but random shapes. People will tell you that you can't blend with acrylic paint, and that's just not true. You can blend with acrylic paint, but you have to you have to have um, you have to do it when the paint's a little bit wet, but not completely wet. So it's tricky. It's tricky. And then take that dry brush again and just scratch over any of the outside lines while you still have, well, it's still a little bit wet. You can hear how dry my brush is. And then if you see any areas that you want to add a little white to, just go ahead and do the same thing. And you can even make some of those white areas just a tiny bit brighter with just a tiny bit more paint. So we've got layers of brightness. But notice I'm not doing it on the sides or the top or all the way down to the bottom. I'm just trying to keep it in the center area to be the backdrop for my trees. All right, I'm gonna let you catch up on that. All right, so as we're painting this, I just want you to keep in mind the objective. So what we're, this is pretty glossy. Um, it's been, it's been a, a coat of finishes on it, so it's very glossy. But you'll see that some of the areas of blue are brighter uh, and some are lighter, some are foggy white, and then there's some parts of the white that are very white. So as we go, back and forth with the colors, just know that you can add color wherever you want, okay? You don't have to follow along with me exactly. Every painting is gonna be a little bit different. So just, you know, feel free to add the colors where you think they need to go because you know what's best for your painting. All right, so I'm gonna take a little bit of red and a little bit of white and I'm going to mix those together to make Pepto-Bismol pink. Kind of like a heart, Valentine heart candy pink or it's a little more 
pink than baby booty pink. It's a true, true pink. Not too shy. And I'm just gonna put in a little bit of pink somewhere around here. And again, I'm, it's that scribbling motion. And if you want it anywhere else, feel free, feel free. If you wanna, you know, put it somewhere else, put it somewhere else, you decide. But it's not a lot. We're gonna come over, um, over this pink with a little more purpley color. So I'm gonna try to keep it subtle, not too much. And then I'm gonna scratch it in around the edges so that the edges fade. I have a dry brush, I'm not adding any more. Just, just making, blending it in. Maybe there's a little down here that I missed, I don't know. I wanna prevent you from doing too much pink. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you the next step. I'm gonna take more of that red and I'm gonna put it in some of my blue. I'm not gonna use all my blue, remember? I'm just gonna use some blue and some red to make a purple. And the more red you use, the more it's going to be this, um, Warmer purple, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And you might need to scooch a little bit of white in it so that the purple, you can see the purple. We want it darker than lavender. We want it to be more purple. Now again, our purple is not gonna be exactly like the purple in the painting and that's okay. It's still gonna be a beautiful painting. Oh, so purple is blue and red. Did I say that? Blue and red make purple. All right, so I've got a purple that's pretty different than that purple, but I'm gonna try it and see if I like it on the canvas. If I don't, I'll just mix something new. That's why I mix in small batches. All right, so I'm gonna just, oh, that's dark. Sometimes you gotta try it and then you know.
I'm going to scribble it on. And then I'm going to dry brush it like we've been doing. And I'm putting it in the same vicinity as the pink, but I'm letting it have its own spaces so that it's not completely covering the pink. You might want to try different mixes of it. Why not? I'm going to get some on there and then I'm going to scribble it in. I'm going to clean my brush and I'm going to scribble it in with a dry brush. rapidly approaching the awkward teenage stage. I probably put on too much purple and I'm gonna fight it, but that's okay. You can go back and forth. You can add more blue or you can add more light blue or more white. So part of this painting is just experimenting, I hate to say. But it really all comes together when we put on the black paint and then we put on the stars and then the snow and the trees. And if you see a place where you think, oh, I scrubbed out all the white, I wanna put some white back in, you know what to do. We're just do it exactly the way we've been doing it. And your colors can overlap. I can put a little white on top of the purple. If yours looks like a big mess right now, you're doing great. It's supposed to look like blotches of color. You can see what that dry brush is doing, <laughs> dry brush technique is doing to my brush. It's making it huge. And maybe you'll see spots where you need to put some blue back in. Just ever so softly and gently.
if you're in finance or IT, or if you're a mathematician or someone who schedules someone, you, this painting's probably driving you crazy because it's much more art than science. And just know that's okay. It does everybody who comes in here. When we paint these background paintings, they're tricky, they're tricky. And it's not like anything we've ever done before, most of us. Most of us don't dry brush every day. I have just the tiniest amount of paint on the bottom of this brush. Just the tiniest amount for dry brushing, for changing the shapes the way I want them. I'm just kind of looking at the original to think, to see, oh, where is there more light in the original that, and where is there more blue or less light? And I'm just trying to do something like that. Around the outsides, it's more blue for sure. And then more dry brushing. Make sure your brushes are clean in between. Just really swish them a lot in the water. It takes a lot of swishing to get a brush clean. Just remember, this is the awkward teenager stage I warned you about. Your painting will really be, um, be like, where are we going? Where are we going with this? Honestly, been there before many times. I'm gonna put something a little more red in, a little purple with a little more red in it because I wasn't pleased with my purple. And hope this one will be a little brighter.
A little white in there too. I don't know about you, but I am not getting anything resembling a bright purple. But again, every time we mix colors, depending on the exact paint that was used, we're not going to get exactly what they did. But pretty soon we're going to move on and just say, good enough. So have you ever seen a sunset and it looks absolutely beautiful and then you run in the house and you tell your family to come out and see it and by the time you come back out it looks different than it did when you were standing there before it's the same thing with these skies that have uh this northern lights kind of look it, exactly the same thing they change and so one minute it looks one way and then another minute it starts to change so just keep in mind that you know it's not going to look exactly, there's no way you can look at it, make it look exactly like the original artist here did. Um, in this painting, this original artist was Alexis. Um, and that's okay. Everyone's going to be different, just like every sky is a little different. And as long as you have little blotches of color in your sky, it's going to be great. When we cover it with the black and then the stars, it's going to be great. Just make sure you have on top of those white big fluffy clouds in those first steps that there's just blotches of color that's what we're going for here and that the blotches of color are irregularly shaped and kind of random and then scrubbed or scratched in so they just kind of fade away If you got all that, you're doing great. I keep adding a little bit more color where I want it, and then I clean my brush, and then I dry my brush, and then I can just use the dry brush to just scratch away any marks I don't like. So my philosophy is if you're 80% happy, doesn't have to be 100%. Remember that this original painting was painted by a professional artist. We're not gonna, you know, I, we're not gonna expect professional results unless we do this every day, right? But if we're 80% happy, we're gonna walk away and we're gonna say, cool. And then we're gonna go on to the next step. And after this awkward teenage stage, the rest is gonna really tie it together. So when you're 80% happy and you think you can live with it, then let's, uh, let's walk away. And we'll call the background done. Just a little bit more over here I wanna. And the reason I say 80% is we're never happy 100%, right? I mean, who is? Even the person who painted this is, was probably not 100% happy at the end, Alexis. Uh, what's important is what it looks like five feet away or 10 feet away. And also, once you have some time distance away from it too, tomorrow, you'll have a different opinion of it than after you've been fussing with it for a half hour. All right, so I think I'm 80% good. I'm gonna walk away. 
and I'm going to just tell myself whatever it is, it is. And that's, that's going to be my background. I'm fussing and fiddling, but whatever, don't go way up at the tippy top. Don't keep painting way up any higher than, than right about there, uh, because this area has to be dry when we put on the black. And so if you would just uh, try to keep this area dry up here, okay? And the reason I'm putting on a little bit more white in some areas is I step back about 10 to 15 feet away and I notice that I just need a little bit more brightness in a few areas. And you only can see that when you're, you know, when you're across the room. When the masters in Europe were painting, keep, you know, uh, well, if you've ever seen any of the masters work, it looks terrible up close, really, a lot of it. The impressionistic stuff, you have to look at it from across the room. It just doesn't do it justice to look at it up close. I'm going to take a medium brush and some black paint. And I'm going to start in the corners and I'm going to paint the sides and the top where I do this as well. So it's pretty solid in the corners with black paint. And on the sides and the top there as well. Pretty solid. And then I'll go across the top with that black paint. Now that's pretty solid, right? Quite a bit of black paint. But then as I come down, I'm gonna to try to look at the sample painting, right? It's lower on the sides. I'm not picking up any more black paint. Now it's more of that dry brush. I'm just gonna take the, the uh, brush that has, that's dirty. I'm not gonna pick up any more black paint. And I'm going to use that wet paint at the top and I'm just gonna go back up into it while it's still wet that at the top. And I have to work quickly to do this so that I can use that wet paint at the top and Denver, it's so dry. And I'm just going to keep going up into to that top wet, pick up a little bit of the paint on my brush and then scribble it down around my bright spots. And so what I'm doing is I'm adding darkness to the sky with very little paint, very little paint. I only had one scoop on each corner of black paint. And I'm just using what's left up there to sculpt around these bright spots because I want this dark paint to be scribbled in just like we did their others, but I don't want anything to look solid. So that was very little paint. It's very little black paint, very, very, very little. And you can see it darkened up the sky really nicely with very, very little paint. And it's not solid. I let some of that blue, I'm gonna turn the light away so it doesn't glare in that direction as much. 
some of the blue is popping through that black too. And that's good because a real sky would have that, right? Just don't put it on heavy, put it on really light and scribble it in, okay? And now our painting's starting to come together more. At least I think so, I hope you do too. And if you have to put on any more in your brush, do it really lightly and sparingly. And kind of keep in mind where you see it on the original painting, more on the sides, and then it dips down in the middle, but not too low. And be sure to paint the sides like that too in the area that it's near. It's easy to put black paint on, it's hard to take it off, right? So just go, go easy on it. And then be sure to clean your brush really well. It should be that you put on such a thin layer of black paint that it dries really, really fast. And I know you guys aren't anywhere close to, to being done with that. But for those who did do it quickly or will be, I'll just show you the next step. Once your paint, your black paint is dry, we're just gonna take a stick, the bottom part of a very small brush, and we're just gonna pop on in the dry areas first, tons of stars, white little stars all over the sky. You see how the painting's starting to come together now? It doesn't look quite so awkward. I'm gonna put some stars on, then I'm gonna go to the chat. And if you, uh, you know, are having any difficulty or if you wanna, um, you know, show me it online, I can give you feedback, but if you're really struggling and you just want to talk to me, feel free to un unmute and let me know how it's going, okay? This is, you know, I've kind of forgot, this is kind of a hard painting actually, with all of these, um, with the dry brush technique. So consider yourself the advanced class. And from the ones I've seen so far, you guys are nailing it. The background on this painting is most of the painting. The rest is easy in comparison. I'm putting my stars all over, literally all over, less low and more high, but all over. It creates that aurora borealis effect that we're going for.
the snow and the trees are going to be a cakewalk compared compared to just what compared to what we just did. I promise. Okay, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and put some snow on here. I've got a big streak there. Uh, so I'm going to use a clean, large brush. And then I'm just going to put snow on about the bottom. Now, I have a 16 by 20. So for me, it's about the bottom four inches of my canvas. Uh, for a smaller canvas, I would say probably three inches. It doesn't really matter, though. We're just going to put a layer of snow. And we're going to do that with white paint and a large brush. And we're just going to pull it across. And it doesn't even have to be flat. In fact, if it's not flat, even better. But it, I am going to put those streaks on with horizontal lines. And then you don't have to paint the bottom of the canvas because it was already white, unless you got paint on it. So that's, that's a plus, right? Now, there were some blue smudges in my, grass, in my uh, snow. And that's even better. That even looks more realistic. So if yours is mixing with the blue, fantastic. Let it happen. Because in snow, there are blue reflections. So that's, you're ahead of the game if you already have some blue mixed in with your white. Okay? I might put mine a little bit higher, just a tiny bit higher at the sides. Kind of brings your eye in. But if you want to make moguls, do that. You do you. You do what you like. That's kind of cool, huh? Then I'm going to take a smaller brush, and I'm just going to put a little bit of blue on the end of it, just a little bit. And then I'm going to scratch on some areas. And my paint, my white is still wet, and that's fine. I'm going to just use this blue and scratch on some little shadows in the snow. And make some longer than others, make some shorter. We can tweak them later if we need to. Can you repeat that step, please? What you're doing? Too white, too uniform. Are we doing like straight blue on that or? One thing I didn't forget to show you is there are a couple little sparkling stars, sparkling stars, actually four to be exact in this painting. And basically all they are is the lower, it's a, it's a cross or a, a, a lower cap, lower case T. And it just looks like a twinkling star. So I'm just gonna take my tiny brush. I'm gonna put just a little bit of white paint on it. And I'm gonna chisel off any clumps on the side of my paint plate. And then I'm going to steady my hand with my little pinky touching a dry area. And I'm going to pick a dot. And then I'm going to come down from the dot with my white paint. I'll show you up close. I'm going to come down from that dot and then go up from the dot and then cross from the center out and from the center out here. Why did I do it like that and not just make a T? When I start with a dot and then I go in the four directions, then the point of it is sharp because I'm flicking down and I get those nice crisp points that way. And you can just do it from one of your stars. One, one, two, three, and then Another one somewhere down here. Put as many or as few as you want. Or if you want to make some other kind of stars, you do you.
All right, now our trees are why we're all here, right? Because trees are cool. I'm not gonna wait for my snow at the bottom to dry. I'm just gonna go ahead. And if it, um, if I have any trouble with it, actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take my napkins and I'm just going to fan it for a minute. I don't want it to be soaking wet, but if it's a little bit wet, it'll be okay. So go ahead and take something and fan your snow and let's get it mostly dry before we do the trees, okay? What's her name, Nancy? Nancy? You could also pick it up, wave it around the room or use a blow dryer or a fan if you have a fan in your room. Go ahead and show you the biggest tree. And I'm gonna use my biggest brush to show you the biggest tree. But then when we get to smaller trees, you can use smaller brushes. This is a flat brush. And what that means is that the part that's attached to the stick, if I move my hand, my paint covered dirty hands around it like this, it's round. But as it goes up, it's crimped. So one side is fat, the other side is thin, and it creates a flat brush, right? A flat surface. Um, so when you paint with this side, you get a very, very broad stroke. But you can also paint with just the line, the skinny part, and that will give you tiny little lines. So I'm gonna use a flat brush for the first step. I'm gonna put paint on both sides of it, and I'm just chiseling, or chiseling it on my plate to get any clumps off. Make sure that all the bristles have paint on them on both sides, but I'm chiseling off any big clumps. And then I'm going to take, I'm gonna uh, actually bring the camera really close so you can see this, okay? All right, I'm gonna take my, hold on one second, I wanna make sure I don't get caught up in the cord. All right, I'm gonna take my brush and I'm going to pop on a trunk using that thin part of that flat brush. Again, this is my largest flat brush and I'm gonna bring, this tree goes about halfway down into the snow. I'm gonna put more paint on my brush, chiseling off any clumps, okay? I'm gonna drop down about a half an inch here. And I'm gonna use just the corner of that flat brush, just the corner to make little baby branches at the top. But then as I come down, they're gonna get wider and I'm gonna put more pressure, more pressure. So no pressure at the top, little baby branches. And then as I come down, I'm alternating sides but lots more pressure. And I'm also gonna make the branches stick out more to keep that triangle shape. Now I need to make sure that I leave space between the branches that you can still see some sky back there. More fullness around the trunk, okay? But leave space between the branches so birds can fly in and build a little nest. And we're gonna take these branches all the way down. Notice how I'm just tap, tap, tapping. Many times on each side with this brush, actually. More pressure, more pressure as you go down. And I'm gonna take it all the way down. I'm not gonna leave a stump at the bottom of my tree and I'll tell you why. If you leave a stump, what that means is that somebody cut off the bottom branches to mow under the tree or to cut it down. But out in nature, you wouldn't have that, right? Uh, so in the trunk area, I'm gonna tap on a little bit more fullness just near the trunk. 
And the reason for that is that you have branches sticking out that way, you have branches sticking out that way, but there are also some growing out this way and some away from the tree. And the only way you can paint those branches growing in the other direction or toward you is to tap on some extra ones over the trunk area, adding fullness over the trunk area only. But I wanna make sure so that it's more full near the center over the trunk and then less full uh, as it, the branches stick out to the side. So that's my first tree. And in this painting, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, and they're all different sizes. So I'm just gonna show you this one more time, unless you ask me to do it again. I'm gonna show you a, um, a tree that's a little bit shorter, and I'm, I'm gonna put it right, right about the middle of my painting, okay? I'm tapping on a trunk. Why didn't I just slide down a line? I'll tell you. I didn't just slide down a line because I want it to be not perfect. Notice I used little tiny baby branches at, near the top of the tree and definitely a point. Every pine tree needs a point at the top because those are the baby branches that are so little you can't even see them yet. You just see the trunk growing up there. All right, and I'm switching sides alternating, but I don't want perfect lines. I don't want it to look like a ladder. I'm tap, tap, tapping and coming out, tap, tap, tapping more near the trunk and coming out. And I'm doing this in a way that hopefully won't look too perfect to Disney World. You want your tree to have each branch look unique, but they're all coming out a little wider at the bottom, a little wider at the bottom. These are happy trees, happy trees. And you could put four, you could put six, you could put three. It doesn't really matter how many you put. I always make trees too big. That's kind of what I do. I don't know why. That's all right. Anyway, I'm going to back up the camera so you can see the original. I'm putting more fullness over the trunk, remember? A little more fullness over the trunk. And now I'll back up the camera so you can see. The, the rest of the trees. And at this point, since I have two good sized trees and these are all different sizes, what I would do is I would switch to a smaller brush, a smaller flat brush to put in smaller trees around it. But here's the thing, when you put in your trees, Remember, this one's this height at, at this um, level, see that? But this one's way down here. These are even higher than both of these. This one's about the same level. They're, they're very different levels, do you see that? This level, then that level, then that level, then that level. They're all at a different level in the snow, and that makes some of them look closer and some farther away. And they're also different heights, see that? So you wanna make some big ones like these two and some that are just babies. I'm gonna put on some smaller trees and could you unmute and let me know if you want me to walk you through the trees again. Uh, one thing, if you're nervous about this, you can practice. Practice on a piece of paper. First, I'm going to put a little baby one over here. I'm going to just tap on his little trunk. And he's sitting up high in the snow. And I'm always going to drop down. Don't start at your branches at the top. Always leave one that's sticking straight up. That's where the trunk isn't growing any branches yet, or they're so tiny, they're just little buds. And I'm always going to remember my triangle shape as I tap down. And I'm going to bring my branches all the way to the bottom. All the way to the bottom. And I'm going to tap in a little more fullness over the center.
the mistake I see people make the most when they're doing pine trees is, uh, I'll tell you so you can avoid them. Uh, one, they don't use enough paint on their brush and then it looks like a scrub brush. So uh, make sure there's enough paint on your brush. Uh, sometimes I see the branches too close together, so you can't see the sky between them. So be sure that there's space between your branches so the birds can fly in and build their little nests. Another thing I see uh, when people are building or doing these trees is they make them um, uh, so that the, they're not triangular coming out with more taps coming out. Sometimes people put too many branches and too many branches are not enough. It's really up to you. There are different kinds of evergreen trees. The ones in Florida are different than the ones in Colorado. Colorado's different than Michigan. Michigan's different than Nevada. So, you know, whatever your pine trees look like, there's bound to be a species just like that. When I went down to Florida to hang out with the Bob Ross folks at the Bob Ross studio, I saw cypresses uh, and I thought, wow, I've never seen trees like that before. Just like that. And so when they painted their pine trees, they looked a little different than mine. Coming from the Midwest, originally. Always tap over the trunks for a little more fullness. And the thing I see most often is people forget to leave that nice sharp point at the top. And that point really says, I am a pine tree. Make sure you're putting them at different levels so it doesn't look like a you know, perimeter of a yard. You want it to look more natural. Different levels, different heights. Bob Ross usually uses a fan brush when he does these kinds of trees, but he does, this technique is very, uh, it's identical to the way Bob does them. When he paints with oils, we do teach Bob Ross oil painting classes here when it's not a pandemic. And I can't wait to start those up again. I miss doing those classes. But he does them exactly like this. And you can use a variety of different brushes to do fan, uh, these kind of happy trees. Um, flat brushes work, fan brushes work. There are a variety of, if you know the techniques, there's a few different brushes that'll work for it. So I have five trees so far, one, two, three, four, five. And this painting has six, but if you're exhausted and you just wanna do three, do whatever you want. We're gonna to have to let this paint dry before we put on our last step. Our next, to, our second to last step, our actual last step is signing it, but our second to last step will be applying the snow to the trees. But we'll have to let these trees dry so we can wave them around the room when we're done painting them with black. Waving them around to dry them if you want. But just take your time, there's no rush. Be some I am.
I have some classes where people ask me 10 times, will you look at this? Will you look at this? Give me some feedback on that. You guys have been so quiet. I hope you're okay. All right, so I'm gonna let this dry a bit. I want this to be dry before I put on the snow. But remember when I told you there was an awkward teenager stage? We got through it. This is practically graduation. All right, I, I wanted to just show you one quick thing before we get to the snow. Um, for the folks who were having trouble with the black looking really solid and then um, it not having a transition between the black and the blue, basically just take a really clean brush and then pick up some of that blue paint. And wherever you have black that you don't want, or you want it to transition more smoothly, just put that on over the black where it touches the blue with just a little bit of paint, just a little bit of paint. And um, you can either put it on straight blue or just with a little bit of white too. And then just go over that area. Oops, that's too white. Go over the area where the blue touches the black and just put in a little bit more diffuse blue um, so that it gets these tones, this medium tone in there. And you can make that black look a lot less harsh by doing that. Now I'm going to have to scrub that in. Where else could I put it? Well, maybe right here. To show you I'll have to scrub that in with a dry brush but it'll just it just kind of removes um, the harsh lines where the black is so let me find a clean dry brush and then I'll scratch scratch remember how we scratch scratch the background before so that's how you break up that black so it doesn't look quite so dramatic You just add a little bit more. The black is really dark. The white is really bright. And so you need a medium tone in there overlapping the light and the dark together. And then when you have that, it just makes the whole thing look like it's less um, drastic. And then you can go back in and you know, put stars wherever you want. So that's the general idea of breaking up that those the black edges that are not soft and making them softer. Hope that made sense. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to put on the white snow. And here's the thing. Here's the most important thing. Just remember, you have to have dark to see the light. So it's a great, um, Bob Ross said that, and he, you know, in some ways was very much like a prophet. You have to have dark to see the light. What a great quote for the pandemic. Next year, we're gonna be so happy to see our friends and see their smiles and, you know, go to sporting events or movie theaters, but we, we won't, wouldn't have appreciated it quite as much had we not had this terrible pandemic year. So you have to have dark to see the light. And what I mean by that when I paint is, I'm only going to put snow on about a third of these branches, a half to a third, and I'm squiggling it on and make sure that you also put it on the tips of the branches. The reason you pull it on the tips a little bit more than, um, just put it on the tips farther out than the, the tree normally would have is because the snow sticks to the outside of everything, right? So it's gonna stick to the ends of the branches more than the middle of the branches, right? And it's not gonna be way inside the middle of the tree. And you notice how most of the black is still showing? So the key to the successful snow start just on the other side of those end branches and then just squiggle on, but don't cover all the black. 
leave about half the black or maybe two to thirds of the black so that you really uh, can see the inside of the tree. You can always go back in and put a little more if you need it. But just remember, you have to, you have to be able to see the dark for that light to look really pretty. I'm not gonna, uh, you could put a tiny bit maybe on the top, but just remember that it's basically the snow is gonna sit on anything that's horizontal, right? And it's gonna attach itself to the outer parts of the tree and not the insides. So it's basically, I'm using a fine detail brush to do this, but you could do it with the same brush you put the uh, snow on, pardon me, the branches on originally. You could use that same brush or a detail brush, you decide. I can show you what it looks like with a flat brush, but start at the very tips of those tree branches and come in and notice I'm doing it pretty quickly. So I'm not trying to cover all the black. I don't wanna cover all the black. All right, I'll show you with a flat brush too. The mistake I see people make the most when they're cut putting snow on a tree is that they just put on too much and they cover all the black. Remember the wind has blown, maybe some little birdies hopped on there. there all that snow is not gonna be on the whole time, the way it was when it first fell. And it's not gonna be attaching itself to the insides of the tree. So here's my tree, here's the top. This is a flat brush. I'm gonna do the same thing I was just doing with that when I put on the branches. It's the same stroke, but I'm not gonna, just don't cover all the black. Don't cover all the black, don't cover all the black. And you can put it on thin or thick. It just depends on the snowstorm you had, right? And make sure you get it all the way out a little bit past the black branches. If you have, I have my volume up now, so I can actually hear if you talk to me. So um, go ahead and answer, and let me know if you have any uh, questions about how to do this tree. And if you would. Everyone's in deep focus. Now I know I have my volume up. And I'm not on mute. All right. Let me know if you need help. It's basically just like we made the branches, except we're not going to cover all that black. We're just making a new layer with white and we're pulling the branches out just a little farther than we did before. And when we're talking about how you make these branches in general, if you're still working on your trees, she, uh, Mrs. V Hill asked if I went on, like did all one side first and then all the other. No, I, I start at the, at the tip and then I zigzag basically across the tree trunk, do one branch on one side, one branch on another, one branch on one side, one branch on another. But I, I, when I say zigzag, I don't mean leaving a Z. I just mean that I'm alternating sides before I hop down to the next branch. And I've got to remember not to put on too much snow. I'm already putting on a little bit too much there. I need to be able to see the black. Now, if you don't put on so much white 
as you did black, if you had a really solid black tree, like we were talking about, if you only put on a little, I mean, a half as much white as you did black and leave spaces in between, that will break up a tree that had the branches too close together and that'll make it look great. So don't over, if you overdid the black, don't overdo the white. Keep it, keep it so that you can see spaces between these branches and the birds can fly in and build their little nests and a little bit more over the trunk, just like we did when we painted the trees. A little bit of extra right over the trunk area because those are the branches sticking out. Basics. I'm here if you need me. Go ahead and unmute if you need me. I'd love to love to help you if you need help. I just have to discipline myself and not put on too much. I don't want to cover all the black, right? You have to have dark to see the light. When you're finished with your painting, what I do is I take the, the tiniest brush I have, a tiny detail brush, and I just run it through a little red paint. Just a little tip, and then I just put two little initials in the corner. I do mine in red. You can do yours in any color you want. But if you do yours in red and put them down there, and then I see them, uh, I see your painting in the Denver Museum of Art someday. I'll know exactly who you are and where where you got the start for this painting. One thing that's in this painting, they, they have really sharp points at the top of the tree and they just have them in black. So that kind of makes sense, right? That the, the tips are so sharp that the snow doesn't really even sit on it, mostly up and down. Just make sure your pine trees always end in a tip, in a point. Because they sure do in nature. All right, well, that wraps it up for me. And I wanna thank you so much for, um, for painting with me tonight and um, supporting a local family owned business. I really appreciate that. We hire local artists to do all of the art at our studio. We have about 500 paintings. They were all made in house. So um, to me, that matters. It's not a chain and we, uh, Think, I think we paid our artists fairly for creating all of our beautiful art. And I hope when the pandemic's over, you'll come in and paint with me in person and maybe even take a Bob Ross class. Oh, uh, one last thing. Let's do one more quick thing. Um, I'm going to put a little more blue underneath each tree in a scribble. Just straight on blue. And that's the shadow underneath that tree. There are already some blue snow marks, but maybe those are footprints or bunnies, but right under each tree, a little scribble of blue for the shadow of that tree. And again, thanks, thanks for supporting our local family-owned business. 